Okay, welcome to my talk about Wi-Fi 6, formerly IEEE 802.11ax, uh, deep dive. My name is uh, Marcel Ziswiller. I joined Toradex in 2011. I spearheaded the embedded Linux adoption there, and I introduced upstream first policy. At times, I was top 10 uh, contributor in uh, U-Boot, as well as Linux kernel ARMSOC. And at Toradex, we have an industrial embedded Linux platform called Torizon, which is fully based on mainline technology. Mainline U-Boot with DistroBoot, KMS DRM graphics with Etnaweave or uh, Nuvo, ODR update with OS3, and Docker or Podman with uh, containerized application stuff. What will we cover today? I will introduce Wi-Fi 6. Then we will have a look at the OpenWRT access point landscape. Uh, I have two devices there that I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail, how they, that those systems are, uh, yeah, what parts they, those systems have. And then we're also going to look at the Wi-Fi 6 clients that are uh, available. And at the end, I show you some uh, real-life configuration benchmark demo use cases. So what is it that this Wi-Fi 6 is all about? Formerly, it was called IEEE802.11ax. And... Uh, it got uh, basically renamed. It's more like a kind of a marketing gimmick, isn't it? That they now use these numbers. It actually got ratified early last year, on, on 1st of February 2021. And traditionally, over the Wi-Fi generations, of course, the, the whole performance envelope has increased, evolved that what this, uh, the diagram is showing. And however, this time for Wi-Fi 6, that was not the main focus to just increase the performance like that, but it was rather about also to increase the efficiency and capacity. That's why it's also known as a high efficiency Wi-Fi. So especially uh, as improvements that uh, increase, enhance the throughput per area, basically targeting dense environments. Like, for example, here at the conference where you really have hundreds of clients that are on your network that you increase the overall performance there. So to do that, to get a higher uh, spectral efficiency, basically. And another part that is totally new, uh, which is then uh, under the term Wi-Fi 6E, is also that uh, we have a new 6 gigahertz band that is now also, uh, we are allowed to operate in that unlicensed 6 gigahertz band. Let's have a look at the main concept of Wi-Fi 6. So one of the concepts is this orthogonal frequency division, multiple access, OF, DMA. So basically the spectrum is broken up into groups of subcarriers that are called resource units. And this basically allows sharing each frame amongst users. So in older uh, Wi-Fi standards, basically one frame could only ever have content of one user. The problem with that is, if you have now contention for it, it doesn't matter how much or how little data a user has, it will always block a whole frame. With Wi-Fi 6, with OFDMA, basically you can share such a frame amongst multiple users. And this benefit also uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is often used for like 
anyway lower uh, rate IoT traffic, for example, for, for sensor devices, whatever. Nowadays, home automation, everything, you, you might have dozens of clients basically flocking that space. Not. Then a completely different thing is that it now also allows uh, 160 megahertz bandwidth channels. This is a little bit, uh, yeah, probably one of the features that is uh, kind of diametral to, the, to this uh, concentrating on dense applications. Of course, if you want a 160 megahertz channel, then that won't work well if you have a lot of clients because you basically usually only have like two such bands even available, for example, in the, in the five gigahertz space. Then another concept is that it basically uses higher order 1024 quadruple amplitude modulation, the 1024 QAM. It's basically from information technology how you really pack the digital bits into uh, radio signals. Usually the way that is done is that you have these uh, two so-called carrier sine waves they, they are phase shifted, usually by 90 degree, so kind of a quarter out of phase. And now you modulate not only the output, so the amplitude, but also the, the phase. And that is how you encode the bits. So I have here an example, for example, of course, from a, one of the very first Wi-Fi standards where we had a 4x4, so a 16 QAM. Uh, you now have to think about that for Wi-Fi 6, it's really now a 32 by 32. So it's a huge space how uh, the bits are encoded. And of course, that uh, delivers an increased throughput. So you can uh, get up to a 25% peak data rate increase over the previous 256 QAM that was used in uh, Wi-Fi 5. Then another concept is that it now allows for up as well as downlink, multi-user, multiple input, multiple output, the new MIMO. So previous standards also had MIMO concepts. At the beginning it was single user only, then later it was also multi-user, but in Wi-Fi 5 it was never up and downlink. So what that now means is that you can basically combine streams for, for one user, if you have like real high data rate, if you want to stream four kilo video or something like that, you can really combine the streams. And of course, that also usually means that uh, the actual Wi-Fi access point, they increased it there. You can now have access points that had eight streams in the five gigahertz band and four streams in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So you can get a total of 12 streams from a single access point. And of course, that significantly boosts uh, the spectrum use. And one thing that is, of course, important in, in such a combined stream environment is that you want that the channel state information feedback uh, is basically the sounding that you even know what clients are there in the, in the radio spectrum. It, of course, works best with clients who, who truly do Wi-Fi 6 and give you the full 8x8 channel feedback. But it can also work if, if uh, uh, this is not mandatory, basically. Another thing is that uh, the more uh, stream kind of bundling you do, of course, it gets more complex and it works best with stationary clients but uh, yeah, performance tests have shown that it also works quite well even when the clients are moving. And you, of course, have the full flexibility. You can have a dual band 8x8, but you could also operate it, for example, in a tri-band 4x4. So the, the latest chips from, from those Wi-Fi uh, vendors, they usually allow for, for kind of 
runtime reconfiguring such stuff. And then, of course, one thing that one is seeing is that uh, the more streams those radios have, I mean, the more power hungry it gets. And, and usually also more expensive. So the kind of the lower end home routers, they most likely will not offer 12 streams. And on the client side, most client devices nowadays still use a two by two configuration. But that kind of makes sense because you will have multiple uh, clients usually per access point. So uh, yeah, as you can see there, if you have an eight stream access point, you can have eight single stream clients or four to two, uh, two streams clients or, or things like that. And of course for IoT smart devices, uh, it's not required to, to basically uh, have combined streams. So if you don't require high data rates, uh, you're still fine. You can use still the one by one antenna configuration. Then another thing in Wi-Fi 6 is the so-called so target wake time. So in earlier Wi-Fi uh, wi standards, that was usually fixed. And in Wi-Fi 6, that is now possible that you can uh, basically have dynamic target wake time, meaning that per use case of, of your uh, client device, you can basically uh, orchestrate in your network when which device will basically uh, yeah, call back again. Not. So this check-in frequency with the access point, this can be really dynamic. And with that, you can, of course, now dramatically reduce power consumption for certain devices. If they don't need frequent check-ins, they don't need to do that. Then another concept that is also targeting this dense environment is the basic service set coloring. So basically the more clients you have, the denser it gets. You will, of course, need more access points or multiple access points. But the problem is the, the spectrum is kind of limited. You cannot, if you now have a dozen Access points, for example, at the venue here, there, there will probably even be, uh, I don't know, multiple dozens of access points likely. And then they eventually will have to share a frequency. And now the problem is there will be some contention going on, basically. And with that uh, coloring, it allows increasing the capacity in such dense environments when re reusing those frequencies. And the way that is done is basically that... Uh, you prioritize traffic, and you do that by basically numbering uh, them, which is what is meant by this coloring. And so it basically then allows that you immediately see in the file header whether that is even uh, your network, and so you can easily ignore traffic from, from a neighboring, from so-called overlapping basic service set. So that can uh, increase reliability in really dense environments. Then another concept uh, evolves around the security stuff. Uh, it basically, WIFO 6 introduces the WPA3 security protocol. So a lot of you guys probably heard of, of some of the problems with earlier uh, Wi-Fi security. Uh, one of the problems is, of course, that uh, using pre-shared keys. I mean, we're, for example, here, we're also using pre-shared keys. It's very nice, not? Uh, usually, <laughs> if you're a returning attendee, you don't even need to know that because your phone or notebook still remembers this Linux 1996 uh, 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 or 90. Now I even forgot about it. <laughs> anyway, the, the key is not a very secret thing. Not everybody really has it. And if you now... Uh, yeah, if you consider such a network secure, that's probably the, the wrong concept, not. And with the 
earlier Wi-Fi standard, one concept they introduced was this Wi-Fi protected setup, WPS. The problem with that is that uh, you kind of press a button on the access point and then you open for a couple minutes or so a window where you then allow clients to kind of connect. But this whole sign-up process only loses like a 23-bit pin and this can, has been proven, can easily be basically uh, yeah, exploited. So if you go in close range of such an access point and somebody presses the button, you can basically exploit that. The solution to that is called simultaneous authentication of equals, SAE, and that is a more secure initial key exchange basically for such a personal mode. I mean, for, for enterprise mode, that of course didn't have such weakness problems, but then you need basically much more infrastructure. You need, uh, you, in your company, you anyway have accounts for your users and you have some certificates and whatever not, then that you don't have that problem, but for a, for, for a personal mode, that this really is a much better way. And this is basically called the Wi-Fi device provisioning protocol, DPP, that is really, can be used to grant access to your network and you can, for example, also use QR codes or NFC tags uh, to to do that initial uh, signing on, on, on the network. Then, of course, also the, the, the actual uh, encryption protocols uh, got a boost. So it allows now to use the 256 Kalawas counter mode protocol, the GCMP256. And as for the message authentication, Codes. It also allows to use the 384-bit hashed HMAC stuff. However, one thing that one needs to keep in mind, I mean, it's kind of everywhere more or less the case, not is that uh, those are just the new algorithms that are now also supported. It doesn't mean that uh, the, the other ones are still kind of there, and it's, it's more a, a policy question or a configuration question whether or not they are still, uh, can still be used on your network. So basically only with, with WPA3, only 128-bit is, is mandatory. And I think in enterprise they even raised that to 192 bits. But I mean, nobody says uh, or forces you to use the 256-bit one, not. So that is, you have to, if you really want to, to have it super secure, you would have to configure your network that it only would allow for those. Another mode that is also new on the security is the so-called Wi-Fi certified enhanced open mode. That basically means that even if you have an open network, that even then it will use strong encryption. So by basically automating that whole, whole process and it will then also, so there aren't any real open networks anymore in, in that case, basically, even they will use uh, encryption. Then some of the other news in Wi-Fi 6 is that uh, it also allows uh, 20 megahertz only channels, which can, for example, be used for uh, IoT sensors. And some of the Wi-Fi 5 features are now also extended to the 2.4 gigahertz band. So in Wi-Fi 5, a lot of these new features were kind of limited to the 5 gigahertz band. Okay, now we have a look at the OpenWRT access point router landscape. Right now, only uh, very few MediaTek-based models are officially supported since OpenWRT 2102. Uh, there are more available, of course, in master snapshots. Uh, there are mainly older RA MIPS or newer ARM-based ones in combination with this uh, MT7911 or 15 Wi-Fi 6 radios. And 
This one is, for example, the disolder RI MIPS, the MT7621AT. It's a dual core uh, MIPS 1004, KC core, 880 megahertz. And it integrates a five port gigabit switch and an additional RGMI. And the uh, good thing, it also has a network accelerator and it supports this HW NAT stuff, which, which is nowadays fully mainline supported. And has three PCI Express, USB 3.0 and USB 2.0. And as I said, uh, I first introduced the other one, the newer uh, ARM one. This is a dual 64-bit Cortex-A53 based chip. 1.35 gigahertz, it integrates already a 2.4 gigahertz, 4x4, Wi-Fi 4 uh, radio. So that formerly 802.11n. And there are also SKUs that uh, integrate Bluetooth 5.0. However, not the 22 PV. I think the 22A has it. So that really depends then on which exact chip you have. Also, this one integrates a five port, uh, albeit only a fast Ethernet switch, uh, but it has a one HSGMI, so a 2.5 gigahertz, uh, gigabit uh, Mac as well, and an additional RGMI. And also, it uh, continues with the HWNet. It has two PCI Express, but now generation two and also USB 3.0 and 2.0 and the later even device and host. But again, also there, only certain SKUs have that. And for, for like uh, uh, net uh, use, it also has a SATA 3.0 or eSATA generation 2. And then the kind of the chips around it, so especially for the later one, which doesn't include a gigabit switch, often used is the MT7531BE. This is a five port gigabit switch which has actually a 2.5 gigabit uh, CPU port. So it matches perfectly there with that uh, Mac available. And then as for the radios, there are the MT7911 and the 7915. Those are dual band, dual concurrent, so DBDC 4x4 or 2x2 Wi-Fi 6 radios, and they can do 20 or 40 megahertz in the 2.4 gigahertz, or 20, 40, and 80 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz band. And of course, those are only the Mac baseband processes, so the BBP, and they will require an external RFIC FEM. And there are also here SKUs with Bluetooth as well, and they integrate a 32-bit RISC MCU, and they do PCI Express 2.1. And the uh, 7975, that's then basically the matching uh, RFIC FEM. As you can see in the graphics here, so it's a, basically a two-chip solution. It's not a single-chip one. Then this is an actual access point that makes use of this chipset. It's the Belkin RT3200, which is actually exactly the same as the Linksys E8450. So it's, it's basically the same device branded under different uh, uh, yeah, brands. The, so it uses this, uh, the ARM-based MediaTek and uh, combines that with some spine end. So it means it requires ECC and, and wear leveling. And as for the RAM, some Winbond RAM, half a gig, and unfortunately this one only has a USB 2.0 port. Who knows why? Because in theory the chip would have also USB 3.0, but that's not how the hardware decided on it here. Nobody knows why, but it is like that. And it has the 7915AN radio, and uh, uses this uh, switch chip that I introduced before. Then some more details. So the problem is that uh, the vendor firmware, uh, which 
it's kind of based on open WRT, which most are, but of course on some like ancient version. But the bigger problem is so this vendor firmware doesn't really do any proper ECC or wear leveling uh, on that NAND chip, even so it, it basically would be required. So what was now happening is that uh, there is a UBI variant of OpenWRT that one can use that really properly then does that is ECC wear leveling. Unfortunately, of course, that means you have to replace the U-boot. But the maintainer created a really nice convenient installer to do this. It even has some kind of a recovery mode, basically. So if, if all goes wrong, it goes into this kind of recovery mode where you can, uh, you basically have like a basic open WRT then still running and you can still then update to a, to a proper release again. So that makes it really quite nice. Remember when you set up such access point, one thing some people forget is you actually have to set a proper Wi-Fi country code, otherwise you won't be able to use most frequencies because the system doesn't know whether in your country you're now allowed to do that or not. So you really have to set that. And then another thing on, on this particular router or, or with this chipset that is kind of known is that this, this whole uh, CPU governor scaling stuff can at times happen that it hangs during a reboot, probably because it is in some kind of lower voltage uh, and it reboots and something like that. So there, there are some ways around that, which you can also find on the, on the wiki. And yeah, if you're more into actually doing experimental stuff, it also has a serial port header available. Actually, it's, it's this kind of standard uh, Linksys type from, from, you know, from the early days of, the, of those uh, WRT routers. It still has a 3.3 voltage level serial port. That's how it looks when you actually run. So th this is actually running even a newer one. I have here the 2203 RC3 now running with the 510 kernel. That is the, the radios available, how it looks in the wireless overview. And uh, when you have an associated station here, for example, this one, you can see it, uh, it uh, is using uh, more than a gigabit uh, bandwidth, basically. Then another kind of a chipset in Wi-Fi 6 is, of course, the stuff from Qualcomm. So the IPQ 87X kind of range. Those even have uh, usually quad-core A53s, even a little bit higher clocked. Some SKUs come with integrated dual-band, dual-concurrent radios. However, not the 71A in this router I'm going to show you later. That one basically uses uh, dedicated separate PCI Express radios. It also comes with uh, four gigabit Ethernet as well as even two 10 gigabit ones, and also USB 3.0. And like I said, it also usually uses uh, some more chips around it. One that is uh, commonly used with it is the so-called IPQ8075. This is basically a five-port transceiver, so it's not a switch. So basically, the the chip here, while it has multiple Ethernet and an Ethernet switch integrated, it doesn't have the FIs for them. So you basically need a separate FI chip, a five port FI chip if you want to do five ports. And then the lower two, uh, three are the radios or some of the radios available in this line. It's the QCN 5024 is basically the four by four uh, 2.4 gigahertz one, the 5054 is the 4x4 5 gigahertz one, and then there is also a 9024, which is basically a dual concurrent 4x4, 2.4, and 5 gigahertz band.
radio. Then that's uh, one of the routers that uses it, the Xiaomi AX3600. Uh, and it combines it with Ronan flash and also with half a gig of RAM. And of course, also uses some power management PEMIC chip and the other, basically that uh, gigabit phi. And one thing it also has, it has actually an older Wi-Fi 5 uh, radio as well, uh, which is this QCA9889, which they basically foreseen to be used in a one-by-one -one, uh, IoT kind of uh, configuration, so for like uh, home automation or something like that, you could, could use that. This is the motherboard of this thing. And yeah, here some notes. So by default, uh, the vendor U-boot is, is actually the, the serial input is uh, or receive is locked. So you cannot really stop there and, and use it for, you know, development or, or whatever. And also the SSH is locked in, in the regular firmware, but th there are uh, known exploits for that. So if you go on the wiki, there are some links to, you know, tutorials uh, or guides how you can basically unlock it and then install OpenWRT on it. Right now there are still only experimental builds for that. Uh, and one thing, another note is that the ATH 11K uh, driver or, or yeah, system, I mean, it, it's, remember it's, it's the driver and there is also some firmware running and whatever not, but all this is really very memory hungry. And another thing is that the stock flash layout of this router uh, doesn't really allow you to make easy use of, of all the flash space. So it only allows you to use about half of it. But usually with OpenWRT, it's not, not a big deal. Uh, usually you won't install 100 megabytes of packages. Not. And another thing to note here is that uh, it also has a serial port available. One can see it here on, on the left side. But in this case, with this chipset, it's actually a 1.8 volt logic level, so you have to be careful. You will need a, a probe or USB adapter or whatever not that, that can really do this 1.8 volt. Otherwise, the, you know, the, there is the danger that you will destroy the chip. That is basically running a, a snapshot. The, there is. Uh, basically, the maintainer, I mean, like I said, it's not really in there yet, but he has some uh, GitHub action, which actually builds uh, regular images, so you can fairly easily install one of those. This is with one of these snapshot images. It's running uh, even later, the 515 kernel, and this is, for example, uh, an associated station, which actually synced with the top uh, Wi-Fi 6, 1.2 1 gigabit rate. Now let's also have a look at the client side. So one of the predominant clients, especially in the notebook uh, landscape. I mean, for, for a while it was really the, the most used one there. Only now certain others are also showing up. So it's the Intel, in this case, the AX210 NGV. So this is a 2x2, two two and it actually already supports this Wi-Fi 6E, like I mentioned initially. So it can do 2.4, 5, or even also the 6 gigahertz band. Plus, this particular model can also support this 160 megahertz uh, mode. And it also uh, yeah, the Wi-Fi part it does uh, on PCI Express and on the Bluetooth part uh, is done by USB. It is in the regular M2 2230 form factor, which is what most notebooks have. Uh, but it also exists in a 1216 uh, form factor, which uh, could, for example, be used for more embedded use cases. 
Then the Linux driver for it is called IWL Wi-Fi. Uh, and there, the initial Wi-Fi 6 support got merged in July 2018. And the actual AX210 NGV is supported since February 2019. The kernel configuration for it is called WLAN Vendor Intel and then IWL Wi-Fi. And you also will need one of these transport, the IWL MVN. And of course, it also requires firmware. So this particular one needs these uh, firmware files. Then some module parameters uh, that can be used is power related. So you can set different power schemes or, or even disable the power safe uh, completely. Because that, that area, at least in my tests, has shown to, to still have, have some problems. And actually, I even with that power stuff, uh, I didn't succeed in getting it to run very stable on non-86 embedded systems. Then another uh, client uh, which is now showing up much more, and also I have some friends who got new notebooks which actually have that now by default, is the MediaTek one, so the MT7921K. It's basically almost the same, but from MediaTek, it's also 2x2, 2 2.45, 2 and 6 gigahertz. Also supports 160 megahertz bandwidth. And also here, the Wi-Fi by PCI Express, Bluetooth via USB. All byte here, only Bluetooth 5.0 LE. And this is also 2230 form factor, key A and E. Uh, the Linux driver for it is called MT76. And Initial Wi-Fi 6 support there got merged in May 2020, and the actual 7921 is only supported since January last year. And the kernel configuration for it, and also the firmware required. And this one actually has shown quite stable and quite high performance, uh, at least on x86-64, but it also run really good in my tries on ARM-based embedded systems, albeit not quite that high performance. But that might also, uh, I guess, depend more on the, on the SOC, basically, of the main system. The another one is the Qualcomm, the QCA6391. That's basically the, the, the client side of the ATH11K stuff. So this one is 2x2, 2.4 2 and 5 gigahertz, dual band, dual concurrent but it only does 80 megahertz bandwidth. So it doesn't do any 6E and also not 160 megahertz. It has Bluetooth 5.1 via UART PCM and the Wi-Fi again still uh, PCI Express. One thing that is a little bit unusual about that one, you can also spot it if I go back to the other slide, if you look here at the, uh, how the connector looks here and compare it to that, it uses a different keying the so-called key E, which is rather still uh, unusual, and it means that you can not really put that easily into a regular notebook unless it would have that slot like that. Anyway, current configuration and firmware for it. It proves to run quite stable and also uh, didn't show any big problems running it in an ARM environment. Then another one, which I have to admit, I ordered some in China, but I haven't received yet, would be the Realtek one. Let's see. That one actually only got merged rather recently in October last year uh, using the RTW89 driver. Then I want to talk a little bit about some use cases as well. So I actually did some tests on a x86 as well as an ARM platform, and that, that those are some of the pictures. Like I said, in the middle you see that you need some kind of adapter stuff to even run this e-key stuff in, in such a notebook, which is uh, rather uh, unfortunate. On the right side, one of our Toradex boards with such a Wi-Fi, again with an adapter, because we still use mini PCI Express and not M.2 slots on our board so far. 
And those are some of the numbers. Uh, this is just with iperf. Uh, and like I said, I had trouble getting the Intel one to work on the ARM platforms. It just kept, kept crashing all the time. So it's, you can't even run any, even the shortest iperf, it just kept crashing. And you can see here on the x86, the, the Mediatek has really good performance. And strangely for, for the upload direction, the, the Qualcomm one seems to be slightly better. That was it. Basically allow you to uh, ask any questions. Are there any? I don't know from the online. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Just, she will bring the microphone. How big a problem is congestion with um, cellular networks that are now using the unlicensed bands? And were there any features added to sort of mitigate that congestion problem? That's a good pro uh, question. I think one of the Advantages, I guess, with Wi-Fi is that it's a it's a local area network. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, ranges, of course, and and also the wattage on the radios is is very limited. That way, uh, yeah, it should not get too much uh, such interference problems, unless you have some radio in the vicinity which which uses much more much more wattage uh, to send, I guess, then, then you basically have not much chance. You're not going to win against that radio, basically not. But I, I'm not sure, yeah. I mean, well, I think that's the problem, right? yeah, I mean, the unlicensed bands are basically, yeah, they're unlicensed. So within this envelope, you're basically allowed to use it, not? But if you have another radio, I mean, you, you often hear of people, for example, that live in some apartment or something where they have some kind of uh, not too nice neighbor or something, which might be doing even something halfway illegal or something on such a band, then you cannot use it. You really have no chance usually. That, I mean, you just, it's useless. It's not usable, basically. You cannot do anything anyway, because... You will need a mechanism to tell the other guy, I mean, you cannot do that, not, but there is no such mechanism. Okay. And Any other questions? Well, we're going to have to conclude the session. Sure, yeah. There's, only, there's eight minutes in the next round of... Exactly. You also find the references in my slide if you're interested to run any of that stuff, or you can contact me. Thank you very much.